Now, we talked about how the Schrodinger equation can be split by separation of variables into a time-independent Schrodinger equation and a relatively simple time-dependent part. What that gave us is, provided we have solutions to that time-independent Schrodinger equation, we have something called a stationary state. And it's called a stationary state because nothing ever changes. The probability densities are constant, the expectation values are constant in the state effectively, since it has a precise, exact, no uncertainty energy, has to live for an infinite amount of time. That doesn't sound particularly useful. From the perspective of physics, we're often interested in how things interact and how things change with time. So how do we get things that actually change with time in a non-trivial way? Well, it turns out that these stationary states, while their time dependence is trivial, the interaction of their time dependence when added together in a superposition is not trivial. And that's where the interesting time dynamics of quantum mechanics comes from. Superpositions of stationary states. Now we can make superpositions of stationary states because of one fundamental fact, and that fact is the linearity of the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation, as you hopefully remember it by now, is I h bar partial derivative of psi with respect to time is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m second derivative of psi with respect to x, and that's a really ugly psi. Must fix. Second derivative of psi with respect to position plus v times psi. So this is our Hamiltonian operator applied to the wave function, and this is our time dependence part. Now, in order for an equation to be linear, what that means is that if psi solves the equation, psi plus some other psi that also solves the equation will solve the equation. So if, say, let's call it A, solves the Schrodinger equation, and b solves the Schrodinger equation. And uh, let me write this out in a little more detail. First of all, I'm talking about a as a, is a function of position and time, as is b. If a and b both solve the Schrodinger equation, then a plus b must also solve the Schrodinger equation. And we can see that pretty easily. Let's substitute psi equals a plus b into this equation. The first step, i h bar partial derivative with respect to time of a plus b is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m second partial derivative with respect to space of a plus b plus the potential v times a plus b. Now the partial derivative of the sum is the sum of the partial derivatives. That goes for the second partial derivative as well. And well, this is just, just the uh, product of the potential with the sum is the sum of the product of the potential with whatever you're, you're multiplying out. I'm going to squeeze things a little bit more here. So I can write that out. I h bar d by dt of a plus i h bar db dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m second derivative of a with respect to space oh, forgot my squared on that second derivative minus h bar squared over 2m second derivative of b with respect to position plus v times a plus v times b that's just following those fundamental rules now you can probably see where this is going this, this, and this. This, these three terms together make up the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for A. For A. <laughs> for A. And this, this, and this, all together, that's the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for B. So if A satisfies the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is what we supposed when we got started here, then this term, this term, and this term will cancel out. They will obey the equality. Likewise, for the parts with B in them. So essentially, if A solves the Schrodinger equation and B solves the Schrodinger equation, A plus B also solves the Schrodinger equation. And the reason for that is 
the partial derivatives here, the partial derivative of the sum is the sum of the partials, and the product with the sum is the sum with the products. These are linear operations, so we have a linear partial differential equation, and the linearity of the partial differential equation means, well, essentially that if A solves and B solves, then A plus B will also solve it. That allows us to construct solutions that are surprisingly complicated. And actually, the general solution to the Schrodinger equation is psi of position and time is equal to the sum, and I'm going to be vague about the sum here. You're summing over some index j, x sub j, as a function of position. These are solutions now to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, the spatial part of the Schrodinger equation, times your time part, and we know the time part from the, well, <laughs> from our back from when we talk, discussed separation of variables, is minus i e, and now this is going to be e sub j, t, over h bar. So this is a general expression that says we're, we're summing up a whole bunch of stationary state solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and we're getting psi. No, oh, I've left something out, and I've left, and what I've left out is quite important here. We need some constant, c sub j, that tells us how much of each of these stationary states to add in. So this is actually, well, it's going to be a solution to the Schrodinger equation, since it's constructed from solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And this is completely general. That's a little surprising. What that means is that this can be used to express not just a subset of solutions to the Schrodinger equation, but all possible solutions to the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. All the solutions to the Schrodinger equation can be written like this. That's a remarkable fact, and it's certainly not guaranteed. You can't just write down any old partial differential equation, apply separation of variables, and expect the solutions that you get to be completely general and superposable to make any solution you could possibly want. The reason this works for the Schrodinger equation is because the Schrodinger equation is, well, just to drop some mathematical terms if you're interested in looking up information later on, the Schrodinger equation is an instance of what's called a sturm liouville problem. sturm liouville problems are a class of linear operator equations, for instance, partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations, that have a lot of really nice properties, and this is one of them. So the fact that the Schrodinger equation is a sturm liouville equation, or the fact that the time-independent Schrodinger equation is a sturm liouville equation, means that this will work. So if you go on to study, you know, advanced mathematical analysis methods in physics, you'll learn about this. But for now, you just need to sort of take it on faith that general solutions to the Schrodinger equation look like this. Superpositions of stationary states. So if we can superpose stationary states, what does that actually get us? One example I would like to do here is, is, and this is just an example of the sorts of analysis you can do given superpositions of stationary states, is to consider the energy. Suppose I have two solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which I'm just going to write as h hat x1 equals e1 x1, and h hat x2 equals e2 x2. So x1 and x2 are solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and they're distinct solutions. e1 not equal to e2. I'm going to use these to construct a wave function, let's say psi, of x and at time t equals 0, let's say it looks like this. c1 times x1 as a function of position, plus c2, x2, which is a function of position. Now, 
at some time later, we can add on our time dependence factors, knowing what the time dependence factors look like. What that means is that psi of x and some general time, each of these spatial parts needs some time part to be inserted. So, c1, x1, and then e to the minus i e1 t over h bar, plus c2, x2, e to the minus i e2 t over h bar. So these complex exponential time dependences come from the time part from our separation of variables. You can think of them as being here as well, just with time t equals zero, which makes both of these factors to be equal to one. So if this is our wave function, let's consider the energy. In particular, let's consider the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator. What does that look like? Well, the expectation value is going to be psi star h hat psi integrated dx. And I can substitute in this expression for psi. So I'm going to get an integral of c1 x1 star, taking complex conjugates, e to the i e1 t over h bar. Now I've got a plus sign because I took the complex conjugate plus c2 x2 star e to the i e2 t over h bar. Again, plus sign here because of taking the complex conjugate. Then your operator, and then just psi itself. So c1 x1 e to the minus i e1 t over h bar, so h bar, plus c2 x2 e to the minus i e2 t over h bar. This is all integrated dx. Now, I know what the Hamiltonian does to these time dependence parts, nothing, and I know what the Hamiltonian does to these spatial parts, since, by construction, they're solutions to the time independent Schrodinger equation. So I can apply the operator to this expression for the wave function. And when you do that, you get c1 x, I should be writing my x is bigger here, c1 x1 star e to the i e1 t over h bar, I'm just copying this expression over, plus c2 x2 star e to the i e2 t over h bar. And now after I've applied the operator to this, I get c1 e1 x1 e to the minus i e1 t over h bar. And this is just substituting e1 x1 for h hat x1 plus the same sort of term for the second part, c2 e2 x2 e to the minus i e2 t over h bar. Still integrated dx. Now, what do we actually get here? Well, as before, some of these terms are simpler than others. These two terms, when we expand out, distribute this expression, will end up with positive and negative e to the i e1 t, e to the minus i e1 t multiplied together is going to give us 1. The same thing is going to happen for these two terms when I multiply them together. Now I'm also going to have terms where I have, like this term, where I have e2 and e1 together, e2 and e1 mixed together like that. What I actually get is, oh, sorry, expanding this out, forgot what my slide said for a moment there, sorry about that. This term, the time dependence is going to go away. This term, the time dependence is going to go away. But the cross terms here, those two terms, the time dependence is not going to go away because you have E1 mixed with E2 and E2 mixed with E1. So what you get, expanding that out, is, as before, integral and 
c1 squared x1 star x1 times e1 with no time dependence. That's what you get from the orange terms here. c1 squared x1 star x1 and then the time dependences drop out which, and we have the, the constant e1 also. From the blue terms here we get c2 squared x2 star x2 e2 for the same sorts of reasons. Now our cross terms plus c1 c2 x1 star x2 and then we have in this case an e2 and we have some time dependence e to the i e1 minus e2 t over h bar. Our other cross term looks quite similar plus c1 c2 x2 star x1 e1 e to the i e2 minus e1 t over h bar. And this is all integrated dx as before. Now, these integrals actually have some nice features. First of all, this first integral here, the first term in this integral, c1, that's a constant, e1, that's a constant, so I can pull those out, and I'm left with the integral of x1 star x1. If x1 is properly normalized, that integral is going to be 1. So we get c1 squared e1 for this first term. The second term here gives us something that looks very similar, c2 squared e2, since the integral of x2 star x2 is unity, provided we properly normalize things. Now, we're actually done. We'll talk more about this in detail later, but the integral of x1 star x2 is actually going to be zero. Everything else here, c1, c2, e2, and this time-dependent part is a constant when we're considering an integral over x. So we're just going to be left with the integral of x1 star x2 dx. And this is a general feature of sturm liouville problems when you have distinct solutions like this, x1 and x2, the integral of their product is zero. Likewise, for x2 star x1 dx equals zero. We'll see a specific example of this in the next lectures when we're talking about the particle in a box. This is connected with Fourier analysis and Fourier series, but for now you can think of it just as a quirk of the nice features of equations like the Schrodinger equation, that you get solutions that split up like this, where your cross terms in integrals like this vanish. So essentially what that tells us is that the expectation of the Hamiltonian is c1 squared e1 plus c2 squared e2. The energies of the states multiply together. In order to check your understanding of this, what I'd like to do is have you follow through similar sorts of analysis given this wave function, write down in your notebook where the time dependence comes in, and write an expression for the probability distribution as a function of time. And what you need to do to really check your understanding is explain in your own words why this has non-trivial time dependence. That's not an easy question, um, but the tri non-trivial time dependence comes from the superposition. Your qu the question for you is why and how that superposition results in non-trivial time dependence. So, to summarize, Classic problems in quantum mechanics, really they all start with some physical system. For instance, a box with a particle inside it. Now what happens next depends on what exactly this situation is, but typically in quantum mechanics you will write down a potential, v of x in the case of one-dimensional quantum mechanics. Knowing that potential will allow you to write down the time-independent Schrodinger equation. That was what we got from separation of variables. So solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation gives you the stationary states 
and it also gives you the energies of those stationary states. That's telling you x of, not x of t, it's telling you x of x and e to the minus i e t over h bar. It's telling you what the stationary state looks like. The next step, and we'll talk about this in great detail, is the expression of the initial conditions of the system as a sum of stationary states. Now you know superpositions are also going to be superpositions of stationary states are also going to be solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So if you can express your initial conditions as a superposition of those stationary states, you're great. You're good. The final step is to add the time dependence to each stationary state. Knowing x of x, this is the time dependence I'm referring to. You need to know the energy, but you got that. Then, basically what you have is that psi of x and t is equal to that sum over j of x sub j. Oops, sorry, I've forgotten again my constant up front. c sub j, x sub j of x, e to the minus i, e sub j, t over h bar. This is your general solution. You've properly chosen your c sub j's such that you solve your initial conditions. You're guaranteed to solve the Schrodinger equation because you're expressing things as a superposition of stationary states. And this general wave function is then something that you can use to answer meaningful physical questions.